This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. We're here to um, talk a little bit about the challenges of scientific research uh, and philanthropy, and we have an outstanding group. Debbie Brooks, co-founder and executive vice chairman of the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Uh, Santosh Kasari, chief of the Division of Neuro-Oncology at the Department of Neurosciences here at the UC San Diego School of Medicine. And Greg Lucier, a really cool guy. I mean, you're cool too, but he is a really cool guy. Uh, chief executive officer of Life Technologies, I, I guess based down here in Carlsbad. Um, and what we have is we've got a, a CEO, we've got a, a doctor, and we have uh, someone really trying to change the gravitational forces around Parkinson's uh, and, and how we think about this. And, and I think it's really unusual and interesting to sort of have you know, a multi-platform talk about moving science forward. And a lot of these conferences, you know, I'm, you know, in the journalistic field, we actually are compelled to be on occasion, the iconoclasts who come in and say, you know, things aren't all rosy, technology's not all good, the dystopia. But I, I guess I, I do want to sort of start at that because when you think about um, something like Parkinson's or any diseases and you look at, I, I'd love to get a snapshot from you because you've deployed so much, you've raised so much money, you have a, a major celebrity attached. What are the downsides of your life? Uh, <laughs> not your life, but of the, of, 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 you know, what are the downsides of, of the challenge, if you will? So what keeps me up at night? Exactly. Yeah. You should be a journalist. <laughs> um, well, if I can just put a little context around this, the Fox Foundation is a public charity, and we've been around for about 12 years, and we've been working to galvanize private dollars, which are really patient, patient-funded dollars, to speed drug development. And if I think about some of the greatest barriers that we face, some of them are about biology, because you know, at the end of the day, biology is actually pretty hard. Um, I'd say I worry a lot about how capital gets deployed and how all the, we're the smallest player in the landscape of medical research around Parkinson's because the NIH is a big player, pharmaceutical companies are big players. So for scale, we'll spend about $55 million this year in Parkinson's research. NIH might spend 125. <coughs> we think industry will spend about 600 million. So we're the smallest, but the way our capital can behave is actually um, far more dynamic, and so I, I worry about how do we know that we're spending our capital smartest or as smartly as we can. And then I worry about um, data, because I think we need more data for better decision making. I see it in our own business, and I definitely see a big shift in terms of where we're going to get the next you know, kind of big wave of data, and I think that's coming from patients, and that's not an easy um, thing to kind of orchestrate within a field like PD, let alone broadly. Um, I do. One other thing I'd say is, in the last day, we've talked a lot about care and uh, delivery of, and medicine. And I think um, we, we can't forget to pay attention to research uh, as a mechanism to get to better treatments. There are 30,000 human diseases, and we only have treatments for 10,000 of them. So we really do have a long way to go. Not that we should live forever and have no disease, but there's some things that we can I mean, do. There are people, people in with. Silicon Valley who talk about the end of death. <laughs> you know, they, they, there are. I mean, this is a. Con I mean, I and have another world, but it, it's people do think about that. They're driven by that. So I just want to put that I'm on your that on your docket. Yeah. But I'm a big optimist. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, you're great. But when you when you think about uh, the other thing we talked a little bit about was you said there's a lot that goes into research, but that's not the only part of it. It's also translation and 
uh, another element which I, I, I assume that getting product out there. And can you share a little bit about that? Because you, you, you talked to me on the phone the other day about some problems that you see, particularly in your field, about, about moving in that direction. Well, I don't think it's unique to Parkinson's disease. And, and you don't really get into peeling this onion until you're touched by a disease and you pause and say, geez, what, you know, what do you have for me to a physician? And they say, mm, not much, or take this pill. But if you really kind of um, do a little bit of a deeper dive, you, as I had to do in helping Michael think about how are we going to build this organization for impact, you know, you kind of see the basic science world, which is um, fantastically uh, funded um, with discovery in mind by the U.S. government principally, and and, um, and then you see this big uh, capital um, commercial uh, investment that comes from pharmaceutical companies, and that's where we're really at the final stages of, um, of delivering better treatments. But in between, there's a pretty significant disconnect between taking aha moments to the drugstore shelf. And we actually don't do a very good job in this, in this um, ecosystem of converting um, discoveries in basic science to human health. And that lack of applied biology in that transla translational space or in the um, valley of death, as many who follow the drug development world would, would know, you know, this is a, a really significant challenge. And um, it, it seems so obvious now that I've been looking at it for a while, but this is just new to the vernacular of how we should be thinking about using capital more smartly and getting better results for our significant investment. I mean, across government and industry, and a small bit of this is philanthropy. We spend probably $110 billion a year in medical research, and that's a lot of money year after year, and in some ways we should have a lot more to show for Interesting. it. Interesting. Um, you may have all seen me just shuffling through my pockets to find something and looking really nervous. It's because I was looking for this thing. Uh, it is, uh, I, I guess, a product of life technologies. It's probably worth a lot more than my house. Yeah? Well, yeah, is yeah. your house worth a billion? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there, there, there are 162 million transistors on this little square, and I had it fumbling around next to my business cards, um, and there are a lot of fingerprints on it now. But this is a, we were talking last night when we heard the genographic people in National Geographic talking about the plummeting price of being able to, um, I don't know the terminology, but essentially, genetically sequence, uh, your sequence genome. Mm -hmm. and this, this can do you uh, uh, or anyone's. And, and Greg Lucier, you've had your, some years ago, I understood that you had your uh, genetic code sequenced, uh, and I don't know if it's on here, but I know that this can process it, right? That's right. Um, so when we jump from what Debbie was sharing with us in terms of misallocation to some degree of some resources, and I, I'd like to come back when we come back to, to, to Santosh as well, to sort of talk about the notion of risk that, you've, that, that, the, the, that some of the biggest achievements they need to make require an attitude and a posture towards risk uh, that some big players aren't necessarily moving towards. This looks like a risk to me, uh, and so I'd love you to take us through a little bit of life sciences, but also this notion of what you've done and how you're looking at the movement of capital l addressing scientific and sure. innovation challenges. Maybe just a little bit of background. Life Technologies has its world headquarters here in San Diego and Carlsbad. And can I just give this back to you because it's making me nervous? <laughs> yeah. And, and we, have, uh, we have a couple thousand people here, a lot of PhDs in San Diego, but we have about 11,000 people around the world. And we're in the business of science to make science a business. Um, so we provide tools and technologies to researchers all over the world doing the type of things that uh, Debbie's foundation hands money out to, to researchers to find answers. Um, maybe just a few thoughts then on, on how we see the world of research happening right now and to your question on risk. I think the macro issue is pretty interesting in that the United States has been an incredible leader in biomedical research over the last 40 years through the National Institutes of Health and then the creation of this incredible pharmaceutical industry. But at this very moment, what's going on is per potentially really the first step and the first kind of stride in decline, I think, in the United States. So my investors are constantly pressuring me. We're a NASDAQ 100 company saying, get out of the United States, go forward into China more and more, because that's where the real growth is happening in intellectual property and the like. And you know, whenever I meet with senators and House of Representatives, they say, don't worry, stay, we're gonna solve this fiscal cliff and this sequestration issue here before the end of the year. The reality is the economy is in an incredible stall period right now. And so public companies like ours, or just even any company, is finding ways to survive and get out of the United States, because that's where the growth is, particularly in biomedical research. 
And it's an interesting inflection point, as I say, that maybe the United States is moving now in a negative direction. Because at the very moment that's happening, you know, I don't want to blow my own uh, horn here, but the amazing breakthroughs taking place now in biology are just staggering. And so my company was the original contractor for the Human Genome Project 10 years ago. $3 billion, one human genome. Craig Venter, I think he actually spoke right, here. Right, last night, yeah. That's his genome that now is the reference for all other future genomes to be sequenced. That was $3 billion and a lot of our machinery 10 years ago. Now, on this chip, you can sequence your genome in two hours on a semiconductor chip. It is revolutionizing not only research, but more importantly, care. I mean, cancer is a disease of the DNA, and finally, we have a tool that will be able to, to see where the mutations are that are driving your cancer and potentially do something about it. Parkinson's, I was sequenced a few years ago and realized that I had mutations for Parkinson's. My mother, ironically, about that same time, was diagnosed with MSA, which is a version of Parkinson's. And so I had her sequenced, and sure enough, she has the same mutations. Now, the next kind of shoe to drop is I have to sequence my father while he's still alive and see if uh, I inherited both of those mutations, uh, if he has them as well. And so destiny is interesting for me in terms of not only risk now, but how do I participate even more than just a CEO, but as a, as a person. As a life this, participant as in this. As a person sounds, in humanity yeah, yeah. to try to solve this disease. So this has really got your focus and... Uh, so anyway, I think it's an interesting point economically, yet science is at an incredibly smart, interesting inflection point, and here we are. So well, before I jump to Dr. Kasari, because you, you raised this very interesting question about innovation abroad from a capital perspective. I'll never forget, um, you remember we used to talk about cloning? I don't know if we yeah, talked about cloning anymore. Yeah, we're the world's anymore. largest cloning yeah. Oh, you're the world's <laughs> largest cloning? Oh yeah, so you yep. cloned, he didn't, didn't, didn't even know that. Yep. But, uh, years ago, I used to follow industrial policy of countries, and Korea would come out every year with what its you know, 10 top uh, technology and industries would be each year, and I would go and hear what they were, and they were always the same thing, flat panel display, semiconductor chips, and then cloning showed up as number 10 one year. And the, the guy who was head of the Ministry of the Economy, Trade, and Industry at the time uh, said something like that, yes, we won't have the same ethical problems as America in this area. And it was done at a point where we were having the stem cell debate. Mm -hmm. So I'm interesting, have you found that it's not only a question of capital, but also a function of different norms, different uh, religious issues and whatnot that, that have enabled you to have freer, freer room to run in a place like China than the United States? Uh, well, we adhere to the ethical standards of the United States, which right. I very... Even if you're in China. Even if we're in China. We, I, I actually very much am proud of what has been created here in the United States from an ethical standpoint around biotechnology. And as much as we possibly can, we want to be the ambassadors of that framework into other countries. A great example is in cell therapy in China. I mean, they are really doing some amazing things, but also scary things that would never fly in the United States of America. And I think it's incumbent upon us here as participants in this global industry to try to spread those U.S. practices more and more, because I think they are the best practices. Dr. Kassar, you're a practitioner. You're out there actually doing the science and thinking. I'd be interested to get your perspective on what you see as barriers to scientific breakthrough, and, and, and reflect on what you've heard a little bit about capital, because I've, I've heard Debbie make, a, I think, a very powerful statement that sometimes uh, money's just not moving in the right corners. And as somebody on the recipient end, because you're out applying for grants, getting government support, getting private sector support, uh, I assume uh, that, that, that you, or hopefully, uh, hopefully you, but maybe your colleagues under Bay Dole, um, are able to financially participate in, in, the, in the creation of innovation in a university. But do you see that large economic landscape of scientific advancement as a good thing or a hindrance to the kind of advances that Debbie is, is talking about? Yeah, so uh, I come from the perspective of a clinician and a scientist uh, as a neurologist, neuro-oncologist, taking care of brain tumor patients where there's a huge immediate need. As much as I'm a scientist at heart wanting to you know, go from the basic uh, understanding the disease and developing drugs and getting them into patient, the reality is we need to do things a lot faster. And that's, Debbie sort of mentioned this about this new translational science of accelerating from the bench to the clinic as quickly as possible. And technologies like life technologies, uh, genomic technologies, really help us do things faster than we did 10 years ago. So genomics, proteomics, RNA level sequencing, 
things like that can be done within a day these days compared to months or years in the past. So I think our, our, w what we've learned uh, or using all these new technologies is that disease is much more complex. Meaning that, you know, in the past there used to be one type of breast cancer. Now we've understood there are at least several types of breast cancer, HER2 positive, HER2 negative, triple negative, etc. For lung cancer we've learned there's multiple flavors of lung cancer. And these are important because they determine the response to specific treatments. And, uh, I, and I think w what we're learning in brain cancers likewise, which is obviously a much more dismal prognosis, is that there are actually multiple flavors of uh, glioblastoma as the main cancer that we deal with. And that we need to really have the tools and technologies to understand that complexity. And then, and then do smarter studies, um, especially clinical trials. As you know, 95% of drugs that come to clinical trials fail. Uh, and, and this is the risks that are inherent in, in biomedical research. But can we do it in a smarter way with the new technologies? And one of the technologies that we've just, uh, that the Nobel Prize was just awarded for yesterday is induced pluripotent stem cells. So these are uh, uh, methods to allow, say, a Parkinson's disease patients take the, the skin cells and make it into a neuron that represents the disease neuron that you can then, in, in, a, in a dish, that you can then screen uh, compounds and try to identify drugs that may help the patient much faster than the previous models that we've used. And, and using technologies, um, these newer technologies really help us understand the complexity at a higher level than, uh, than we've done before. We we're pretty naive, you know, we, one gene causes one problem, but the reality is there's multiple things that are interacting and causing problems, and we need a broader, more systems biology approach to identify better targets, uh, and drugs for those targets. Let's just imagine for a minute that you were Debbie Brooks and you were running the Michael J. Fox Foundation and you had this responsibility for popularizing, well not popularizing, but basically focusing public attention, raising money, deploying that money. What would you do differently than she's doing? And then Debbie, I'm gonna come back to you and ask you to be the clinician scientist. Uh, and, and, and we'll get to the CEO later, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think money, I mean, people think science or scientists and progress is made by smart people, uh, which it is, but th you, you need money and funding because the ideas are there. A little bit of smart people and a lot of bit of money? A lot of money is yeah. needed. There's, there's plenty of great ideas and I think what we need to do is really push things forward in a strategic way because I, I, I'll admit there are probably waste, uh, wastages of, of our resources on some projects that probably will not get you what you want. And uh, I think the NIH over the years has been focused on doing more translational science rather than really basic uh, science. At least that's what they say, although you know, the grant process is still very basic science heavy in terms of the reviews. Um, so I think um, in terms of uh, uh, if I were in Debbie's seat, I would probably open up a brain cancer foundation and, <laughs> <laughs> and fund, <laughs> raise uh, hundreds of millions for brain cancer research. But uh, no, I think, uh, I, I think you have to engage and explain to the public what the problems, is, problems are, what progress we've made, and what we need to go to the next higher level of bringing real substantive uh, cures to patients. Okay, Debbie, now you're the scientist. Can I be Debbie first? Yeah, cook your <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but, so I, would, I do think that it's about um, more money for research, but I do think it's about how we um, spend the money. And I do think it's very critical to understand the difference, you know, what strategic funding looks like. And so, and, and this wouldn't um, meet everybody's goals, but our goal is to speed drug development. So we're going to look at spending dollars differently than NIH might, and we want to complement what they do. But there's, a, there's no end to the, n the number of interesting questions that we can ask scientifically. I mean, honestly, you just look around every academic institution. Tons and tons of questions that are interesting. The question, the Does art that move is, drug development the forward? The art is, what are the, what are the one in 20 questions that are relevant for drug development? And mm. so it's, yes, more money, and a lot of things are going to fail, but there is more thought that we can put into how we prioritize which questions we ask and fund. And I think, and when, I th when, when someone like Debbie Brooks goes out to try to build a capital base, one of the things we're doing is talking about our process for how we're going to go about this so that partners, funding partners want to come along. And I think that is one of the ways we've been able to attract capital, but also it's how we're deploying the capital. And so those things go hand now in I hand. Now I assume there's a retreat somewhere where everyone that's ahead of a, of a big health foundation goes and they compare stories. So is your story, is your template 
with the Michael J. Fox Foundation similar? Do you find across the field in other health uh, ailment areas the, the same focus on drug development? Are they, are, do they f have the same frustrations you have? There are only a handful of disease indications that have a group like the Fox Foundation. I so see. cystic fibrosis, myelin repair, um, part of MS, uh, multiple myeloma research foundation, probably, and the Fox Foundation are probably the ones that kind of are Stand out. At, at the top where, you know, most big public charities are f in the disease space are focused on patient services and very small portions of even of their program dollar is going to research. And so they aren't expert in, they might be um, expert in care providing and they know their patient community and they're actually often very good at raising money, but they actually aren't very, uh, they aren't, um, la don't have a laser focus on research, uh, and which means they often aren't really strategically using their funds for accelerating drug development. So can I make you a scientist okay, for a moment? Yes, I'll be. Yeah. Um, I think it, it's an interesting thing. We're working right now trying to figure out how to educate physicians, so I've been trying to put myself in that, um, in that boat, and I do think, um, you know, a, a disease like Parkinson's, it helps to realize two-thirds of Parkinson's patients never see the right doctor. So I worry about the doctors who think they're treating a patient adequately who aren't. I worry about our patient community where the average age of onset is about 60. Um, you know, how do they get educated that, that, that's still kind of a generation of people who think the doctor ha knows everything and they're not at the right doctor, you know, so they're a big disconnect and I worry about how do we educate physicians and I look at this not with this notion that, you know, damn those physicians, they're not doing their job because I, I think there's a really big disconnect on how we train um, people who are providing care, how we train researchers, you know, there's not a lot of, unless you're in my job, you wouldn't kind of rise above this whole system and be um, assessing it and critiquing it and thinking at the margin, what can you do next? I think it's tough to be a physician for a Parkinson's patient where, you know, you're probably thinking about a seven minute um, me, uh, appointment and the, cr the bluntness and the crudeness of the metrics that a physician uses, a neurologist uses when they're testing a patient, they do things like have a patient stand up and walk down the hall and they time them with a stopwatch. And then they make the notes and then they do things like ask you to, you know, like how fast can you do this? And they're counting. I mean, this is, this is our way of determining, you know, kind of where is someone in Parkinson's. They don't, we don't have biomarkers. We don't have so many things that would provide better tools for care, but also inform our research process. So. I, um, I think as a physician or as a researcher, I, I think that I'd, I'd be welcoming um, bringing together kind of the basics of biology and what phenotype can bring to our ability to uh, make progress in research. I want to be embracing what the patient can bring into this. I really liked earlier one of the comments where it's, it's not so much about patients participating in research, they're collaborators in research. And physicians will a be able to do a better job over time the more the patient data can be um, put forth. And, and it's interesting, you have to think about the kind of thing that every scientist or physician would ask a patient. Um, do you have a Parkinson's, uh, you know, any Parkinson's in your family? Do you, um, what kind of, uh, what kind of um, job do you do? You know, maybe environmental exposures, things like this. It's all the things that no one ever asks a patient. How do you think you got Parkinson's disease? And boy, you are gonna get a, a wide range of answers. But, you know, if Google's taught us something, you can have, you know, the law of large numbers, you get a lot of data, you'll be able to parse through and really see patterns that can inform how we do things. So, as a physician, what, if I were a physician researcher, I'd be looking for and, and trying to figure out how I could contribute to bringing that phenotypic data into research. Let me ask Greg uh, about that a bit. You know, where, what is the state of sort of big data and, and science today in terms of this in the reporting? Because I know that privacy uh, issues are part of the struggle versus um, essentially, I, I know I the Atlantic in fact- I think it's purported in the yeah. media a lot, but right. there are you know, obviously two big pieces of legislation that I think do a fairly good job of protecting privacy, HIPAA and then the GINA Act, which uh, really makes sure that genetics can't be used for discriminatory purposes. Um, I think Debbie's on a very important point though. If you fast forward into the future, I think we have to make every patient a research patient. That's really where you can accelerate then unraveling this complexity and getting to cures faster. Today, that's not how it gets done. So if you go to talk to the CEOs, the big pharmaceutical companies, they are 
absolutely focused on how do they convert the healthcare system to where more and more every patient someday is a research patient. And I think we're on our way. Look, um, by 2020, most of the United States will have electronic medical records. So we'll have a lot of that phenotypic data categorized in computer systems. If you look at the rise of genomics, genetics into healthcare, it is going to require enormous IT systems. We're acquiring companies at a prodigious rate to do that. So private enterprise will be there to fill that gap. So as we move forward towards this 2020 kind of horizon, you're going to see these electronic medical records and these sophisticated genetic systems come together. And there'll be others, obviously, imaging data and the like. And we will be able to have the you know, harnessing of big data. If we can do that and we can have each patient interaction be another data point towards insight, I think we can make enormous progress. What do you think, let me just ask you, because you, you exist in a government where you're private, you've raised private capital and you're doing well on NASDAQ and you're global. Um, what is the interaction with government? Because I want to get back to the whether the government, I know the fiscal cliff problems, mm -hmm. but let's drop those for a moment. But sure. on the other side of NIH funding or funding this or cooperating and providing some sort of collaborative step to do the things the market's not doing, I'd love to get your all, all three of your insights to see if the government is doing its role in, in, the, in the things that, whether it's regulatory or also funding, that the marketplace is not taking care of. Well, I would like to see more obviously spent in the NIH, and we work that issue hard on Capitol Hill like any good private enterprise would. But as an American, I also have a more altruistic motive. I think it creates a higher standard of living. And I just fundamentally believe that the more you spend in this space, the more you're going to have great people like this and more and more of them. And I think they really add to the intellectual property of a, of a country. Um, beyond that, in terms of the regulatory scheme, look, the FDA is three steps behind. But um, I think they've made a conscious decision. They are going to be the regulator that's the slowest and the most difficult and the cutting edge drugs will end up here last. It's the safest though. And quite frankly, again, our society has, has chosen safety over speed. That's the bottom line. And we're not allowed to have mistakes on drugs like perhaps 20, 10, 20 years ago we may have tolerated. So the FDA is the regulator kind of as the slowest and more and more companies are going to Europe first then China and then they'll come back around the United States. It is a travesty because the science is here and we're not deploying it to approve more drugs faster. So, Santosh. Yeah, I, I echo Greg's uh, comments. I, I think you know the funding for NIH has dropped over the years, and I think we're not investing uh, in the future, future drugs, future uh, 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 discoveries in in ha medicine and health. And uh, you know the this year's Nobel Prize was you know not awarded to anyone. In, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells were not discovered in the uh, U.S. Uh, well, at least the 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 Nobel Prize wasn't given uh, to anyone in the U.S. And so I think, um, I, I think these b investments in NIH really do uh, translate into a, a large part of the economy in terms of the technologies that are developed, the drugs that are developed, and the quality of care that we provide our population. Debbie? So NIH, I think, could use more, mo more funding. Um, again, I would argue that it also needs to be more strategically conceived of, and so I'm not convinced that the way we just put money on the table and bring all, you know, welcome all comers is the smartest way to be allocating the $35 billion we spend each year right now. And then when I look at FDA, you know, it would be a high class problem for me to have to be chaining myself to their fence, begging them for cheap, you know, uh, faster approval. We can't even get that far yet in Parkinson's. So, you know, this drug development life cycle is decades long and billions of dollars. And, you know, there are plenty of people who aren't in front of FDA yet trying to make progress. Having said that, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the fact that I think the FDA budget is something like the equivalent of the Montgomery County school system. I mean, they are operating with extraordinary responsibilities on real shoestrings. And so I'm not sure we have funded them to do their best work. And I'd rather, you know, I'm not sure we should trade off safety. I mean, we're very um, capricious about that as, a pati as patients. You know, we don't, we don't mind if somebody else is at risk until it's us or something goes wrong and we're so litig litigious. So I don't know, that's not a, an easy conundrum to deal with. I actually think the best way for us to overcome some of these things and even to speed things in, at FDA is with more data. And so biomarkers is a great area for us to be investing in that would inform um, FDA's risk decisions 
It would help us know that we have the right people and they're getting the right drugs. And again, that comes back to the call to action that we've already discussed, which is people need to participate in research. And you know, I see this in Parkinson's. Um, if we're doing a drug trial, um, we would be lucky to get one patient per month per site recruited. So you have phase one, you have phase two, you have phase three, three different intervals where you're trying to recruit more and more people. Years are spent just getting people into the trials at great expense and great delay. And so I think we need to have a shift uh, about the role we play as collaborators in our own solutions for better outcomes. Um, you know, I wonder in this room, there's a lot of interest in science and health. How many people here have participated in a research study? I mean, right? Larry, so if you spit Larry in, participates if you in every measured study. <laughs> <laughs> but if you spit for 23andMe, which by the way, we have a big collaboration with them in the Parkinson's field, that is participation in research. I think we need to rethink what participation and collaboration looks like, but a lot can be done for um, I individuals to take a more active role in being part of solutions around better treatments. You know, um, Go ahead, Santos. No, I was just going to comment for especially for diseases like brain cancer where the need is so great. It's it, it's amazing. I feel bad sometimes because the patients actually want to do more. They want to participate. They they will sign anything. They they want this tissue to go anywhere to sequence to understand the disease better to find new solutions. And sometimes it's the regulatory, uh, the university or the the the, the, the regulations <laughs> that actually slow us down. Should do a review. Um, Greg made a very interesting comment that um, I've been pondering. He basically, I won't put words in your mouth, but said basically the sun is setting on the U.S. innovation base in this era. That that, that age is passing, and right or, to be, or, wrong, or to be more shared. Yeah, yeah, but right or wrong, it raised the question: In your business, do you just track what's going on in the U.S., or do you take now a more global perspective about R&D developments that are outside the U.S. shores? So we make our asset allocation. Do you have a Chinese speaker um, in, on staff? We don't have a Chinese speaker, but we do have a reasonable number of languages represented. We have, um, I think, 10 PhDs on staff, MDs, MBAs. And we put them together, and they are basically running a um, incubator fund for Parkinson's drug development. So they're looking at ideas across the globe. About a third of our funding ends up outside the US. And um, we aren't really that prescriptive. We don't say, oh, an idea is better in Canada than it is in Israel. I mean, we're interested in the idea. Um, if it's in the right hands, does it have um, you know, kind of outcomes that are measurable, um, even if the outcome is negative? That's informative. And so we're kind of putting those asset allocation decisions in context. And we also fund academic labs biotech companies, and big pharma. Oddly enough, even though they have a lot more money than we do, we can get them to do a Parkinson's program that they otherwise may not do. So we're kind of agnostic, and I, I would say we see innovation in a lot of places. I think the very what, what, what's missing in the US, in my mind, is innovation around the process of being smarter of how to capitalize on the investments we're making. And, and, and before I go to the audience, let me ask just one uh, politically incorrect question. When, when I was in the Senate in the 1990s, uh, my boss, Senator Bingaman, was approached by a Dianne Feinstein on the floor of the Senate to support the idea, and I think it eventually did happen, a, a breast ca cancer stamp. And so if you bought this stamp, it would donate money to breast cancer. And uh, I want to admit that I told my boss not to do it. I thought it was a really lousy way to fund science and to fund diseases that you ended up with a competition based on you know, other factors than, than this. And, and I was unpopular in my office. Um, because it was so easy to be seduced into the idea that this is important, so focus attention. Uh, and you have Michael J. Fox, whom we all love, as the head of foundation. But, but the question is, does that, I, you know, spending time with you, I know that you're just so stable and sound that this does affect you, but it raises the question about fad science, fad investments, and whether that is a phenomena that you have to struggle with from each of your different roles, or whether Greg Lucier is out there basically filling the holes from a commercial perspective uh, wherever they may be, or science may be doing that. So, so do you need a celebrity, do you need a postage stamp to move uh, a health agenda forward? Uh, or is there, are there balancing mechanisms in the system? So I definitely think there's fad philanthropy. So I can't comment about fad science. Okay. Um, and I, if, if, um, if, if our foundation had been started as the Debbie Brooks Parkinson's Research Foundation, we'd pretty much be nowhere. 
Um, Michael attracted incredible intellectual capital, but he also you know, starts at a platform that's not replicable. I mean, it, I have a lot of groups come to us and say, hey, we would really like to be doing in PD what you guys, in our field, what you've been able to do in Parkinson's. And I'm happy to, and, and often do, kind of map out, this is how we see the world, this is how we've learned, these are the mistakes we've made. These are really the things you can do, and, and we like to encourage smart use of philanthropy capital. But, you know, the one thing they don't have is some something like Michael who just just you start on day one with a trust and a sensibility around um, genuineness focus on the outcome uh, uh, and also he I mean just as a person he has he's very smart and has a lot of clarity so you just you, we just kind of started in a better spot than most people would I think he one of the things he said to me on on our first day was people are gonna send us money just because of me. He met him, not me. Um, and he said, the important thing is that we treat it the best we can, regardless of whether they wanted that from us or not. So he had his own um, meter of integrity for the use of funds. He said, but also that we earn the second gift. And that will be all about what we do with the money. And I think what I really like to see is when, a, when somebody who's high profile, and I think we zero in on um, celebrities a lot, but it's also very wealthy people who aren't necessarily celebrities but really can drive a lot of philanthropy and it's it's what they bring to it in terms of demanding impact or being focused on real real measurable gains mm. santosh um there is fad science and fad fad medicine um, and i think one of the things as scientists and doctors is we're, we're not politicians we don't uh, go and uh, try to get the, NI uh, the government to you know, fund NIH more, et cetera. And I think we need to do that. We need to be able to uh, support what we think is important, but we often don't because we're so busy. In, t in terms of fad science, what I, what I mean by that is that sometimes the NIH has certain goals. We're going to invest in genomics, proteomics, et cetera, and then everyone jumps on the bandwagon. Whether it's, I mean, it's good, uh, but sometimes it's bad and you end up wasting money because not so You've overdone it? Yeah, we've overdone and it. And underdone something else. Yeah, and likewise in clinical trials, uh, what I've noticed uh, as, as uh, someone working in oncology is that, you know, there are these drugs out there. There are a limited set of drugs that companies have made from academia or industry, and we need options for our patients. So we make a rationale for one drug and use that drug in a clinical trial. It ends up failing for the most part, as I mentioned. And, and what we're missing is the ability to develop really new and innovative drugs. Because it's easier to just get a drug that's on the shelf and use it. Uh, it may or may not work, and most likely doesn't, because it wasn't really made for that purpose. It was made for something else. So I think we, we get into the habit of doing those sorts of fads in medicine and in science. But uh, having said that, there is opportunities. Actually, there are drugs out there that are been used in humans and that many people are repurposing uh, in uh, for neurodegenerative diseases, for oncological diseases, and combinations of drugs, uh, which I think is, is a tremendously uh, high potential of, of really making a difference in our patients. We don't have to necessarily go make new drugs. For brain cancer, I think there is a need to do that. But for some other uh, indications, I think there are drugs out there already that we just have to figure out what, uh, based on actually a lot of the systems biology, all these networks, all these great internet technology, that we have of making connections that we didn't realize were there and picking a drug that could potentially slow the pace of neurodegeneration or slow the growth of a tumor cell. So I, I think you know, th there, there is a focus um, uh, or, or investment needed to focus on things uh, of that nature. Greg, how do you see this? Well, I would look at it on two levels. One, at the government level on your example of the postage stamp. You know, look, I come back to the late 90s, Clinton, Newt Gingrich doubled the NIH, and they did it very strategically with a purpose in mind. And I think the government, if it's going to play a role here, should be that strategic and shouldn't waste their time on postage stamps. So I think right. you made a good decision. Good, thank you. But, you know, we're lacking a strategy today, and hmm. to Debbie's point, the NIH uh, gets a lot of money, but I think they should get more, but they should also restructure, too. At the private industry level, I think Santosh makes another good point, which is if you look at this industry of making drugs, it's the only industry I know where if you take a category, there could be six to seven drugs that do the same damn thing. Find me another industry that does that. And it's just a complete waste of resource. So it's not a fad, but it's a misallocation of capital. And I think that penalizes the industry then because investors get burned when they're the seventh drug on approval. 
So, you know, I think that is starting to change to where because so many investors got punished, we're now putting money more towards these very innovative medicines and the tools are now in place to allow them Just to Just one quick question to this, and I, and I do want to go to the audience. Is, is there, because uh, I know I'm not from, I'm a foreign policy guy, but is there honest discourse about that? Is that a recognized, written about, talked about On the private issue? industry side, absolutely. That, that change is well underway. On the government side, not so much. No. Debbie? So I think that industry is now kind of given up on the Me Too drugs, and but industry sits back today and is certainly in a field like neurodegeneration and says everything's too risky, so they don't know where to go. So repurposing is now kind of an interesting way to go, and again, we'll do better in repurposing the more patient data we have because we're going to learn about safety. We know about safety of these drugs first, which is why we are confident we can redeploy them quickly. But there's something else about innovation that still, that I at least in our experience, when the Fox Foundation started in our very first years, we were doing a small number of very small grants, and, but our, our earliest innovation was we took more risk. The fact that we existed, the ideas were not spontaneously combusting. I mean, it's not like there had been no innovative ideas and now today there are because of our existence. We were just willing to fund them. And it was because our concept of risk and return was very different than how NIH looks at risk and return or how a pharmaceutical company looks at risk and return in Parkinson's. And so for us, we're like, well, that's a flyer and it doesn't have tons of data, but geez, it has some scientific rationale. And for our philanthropic dollars, we can do that. And 12 years later, we have a lot of novel targets in clinical trials now. And it wasn't that we were brilliant. It was just that we had a different algorithm for making that decision. And w another thing that we can do, which differentiates uh, us from the other larger pools of capital, is it, because we're nimble and we kind of look at the, the picture in a different, through a different lens, is we can invest in um, ecosystem challenges, like look for a biomarker. And I mean, biomarkers to me are one of the great opportunities for transforming our ability to get better treatments. And we heard a lot about that earlier. And, you know, we talk about blood, we talk about stool. Um, cerebral spinal fluid is a gold mine. And, you know, when we look at these diseases of aging and neurodegeneration, you know, this is where we're going to get a lot of information. And investing in biomarkers in the next two, by the end of um, 2014, we'll have spent $100 million dollars at the Fox Foundation on looking for markers of progression in Parkinson's disease, and we're finding stuff, you know, but nobody else would lead that effort. That's not a NIH gig, and that is not an industry gig. And so a, pur a, a purposeful organization focused on science in a specific disease can, can break through that kind of challenge and, and be innovating, even though the science isn't, the science was kind of there, it's just nobody was focused on funding it. Excellent. Thank you. Let me open the floor to questions. Let me jump right here. Philip Graham with the Sanford Burnham Institute. My question's for Greg. Uh, Greg, thanks to your, the decisions you've made and the risks you've taken over the years, we now have the ability to sequence the genome in less than two hours and around $1,000. On is that no chip. On that chip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that leads us to another issue, which is now we have all this data, and we don't know much about it. Yep. So what, what technologies or processes do you think are going to be able to address that, that problem um, succinctly? Great question. Great question. Um, you're seeing that entire information technology infrastructure being created as we speak. Um, as I referenced earlier, uh, as a player in that space, we just acquired a company on Monday out of University of Michigan that will do a certain portion of that analysis. Other companies like Google are trying to do certain aspects. I am highly confident that you know, we're going to create a very big ecosystem here to do that type of analysis of genetics. And I think it will be the very first time we actually really do drive this point of each patient becomes a research patient. As you know, genetics is all about comparisons. And so as we can get more and more people sequenced, we can have more and more comparisons, and then we can make more and more insights. And so I think this is a really exciting point of the merger of science and healthcare for the good. Great. Uh, let's go right here. I think when um, we're, we're talking about cur curative solutions, um, it's almost a foregone conclusion that you're looking predominantly at, uh, uh, at drug therapies. Um, yet, um, and, and in fact, if you look at um, where most of the resources are going out of our 100 percent of resources, probably 90 plus percent probably are going towards uh, drug development and research along those lines. Yet, when I look at the top 300 or so 
pharmaceutical products out there, I don't think I see very many cures out of those, uh, those products, um, with the exception of a few antibiotics and maybe occasionally a cancer product. Uh, um, and this is sort of directed to Santosh, but I'd be interested in the other panel's thoughts as well. Um, if it were your 100% of resources to spend um, on trying to find a cure, let's say for Parkinson's or perhaps for brain cancer, would you be putting 90 plus percent in pharmaceuticals? And if not, what other technologies would you look at? Good question. Santosh? No, great question. I think, you know, you're, you're, you're in charge of everything now. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I mean, we talk about cures, but I think what we really mean is m managing and make tr transforming something that's really deadly acutely to more of a chronic disease, as we've done with diabetes, hypertension, and things like that. AIDS. Uh, AIDS. A a AIDS is a great example. And, and those are essentially cures. I mean, they're living for many decades. Uh, in some cancers, we have cured the disease. Uh, they're still chronically treated. Uh, the best example is chronic myel myelogenous leukemia, uh, which is, in, in, a, in many ways, compared to the cancers that we deal with, a very simple cancer. There's one genetic mutation. And, uh, and this is the example that really drives us all, that drug development, if you understand the disease, will really have a great impact. Because with that single mutation, a drug was developed uh, called imatinib, and that drug has really transformed uh, patients, uh, about 2,000 patients a year in the U.S. from a deadly disease to uh, patients who have normal uh, uh, lives r right now. They live... Uh, so uh, that was a silver bullet. Yeah, that was a silver bullet. But, uh, but that was a one-gene disease. We know what the exact mutation is. And the problem is a lot of diseases are not that simple, especially solid cancers, multiple genetic changes, hundreds of genetic, thousands of genetic changes. Parkinson's, it's even, even though there's some familiar forms with one mutation, there's probably over time multiple other things that are happening that we don't understand that are not just DNA changes, that are at the level of RNA or the level of protein or physiological changes that we have to understand better. So uh, I, I think we, are, we do understand that uh, as much as we'd like to find that silver bullet, probably, and, and more recently, what we've done is really had incremental benefits with all the new drugs uh, that have come to, to market for lung, melanoma, et cetera. Uh, but I think, um, yeah, I, I still feel uh, that 90, I, I would probably spend 90% of my money in new drug development. I think what we're lacking is new drugs or using old drugs in, the, in a better way uh, that we didn't realize we could do. Um, so I, I still think drug development is a way, but biomarkers is obviously a huge thing, and in oncology, that's, that's very big. At the genetic level, at the protein level, identifying real markers. So what I mean by that is a lot of drugs over the last 10 years have failed for glioblastoma, but if you look at the data carefully, about 10% of patients actually had a good response. And, it, and, and s some of this is based on our research as well. If you go back and look at those specific patients, if I had a database, a Google database of all the genetic variations in this patient populations treated over time, you could fo probably find the same thing that we found, that in, in some subset of patients, a specific marker that would have told you you should have done the clinical trial differently. You should have focused on that subset of patients. Debbie, how would you spend the money? Well, we pretty much have to answer this question for ourselves every year, so um, we do put a significant amount of our funds to work on specific therapeutics. Um, but we divide it up. We, about half of our therapeutic investment has gone into disease modification, so something that would slow or halt or reverse disease progression. We have no drugs like that today. That's the greatest unmet need. At the same time, as we've scaled, we, we're able to do more than one thing, right? So we're looking at disease modification. We're looking at untreated symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And that's an area where there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of new appreciation for the complexity of the disease and the non-motor symptoms of PD that are predating the first symptom by a decade, let's say. So it gives us new things to focus on. We're also looking at drug side effects. Can we eliminate those or treat them differently? And, and success in those, uh, in those other two areas, other than disease modification, would in fact feel, it, it transitions PD from 
um, you know, a, a poor life experience to a longer and perhaps better quality of life experience. But we are also making the platform investments like biomarkers, like animal models. You know, we think of our capital as de-risking the whole field of drug development. So we're going to end up doing a lot of different things. And I don't know if you're getting at this with your question, but I would add, we look at non-pharmacological interventions as well. And so, you know, we've been looking at, uh, you know, testing the benefit of exercise in Parkinson's disease for, as an example, um, to see if you can slow uh, progression. So it, we look across that board. Yes, Quentin, well, I'll take these last two questions. Hi, Joe Weiss, and you've been talking about brain cancers and Parkinson's. I just want a quick question about some of the more important issues out there. You know, two of the big drugs in the marketplace over the last few years have been Rogaine and Viagra for hair loss and uh, erectile dysfunction. And yet the story behind them was a serendipitous finding for both of them. How often, and I've heard the story before, science relies on serendipity more than directed research. So when you're focusing on a project, how important is that to get the end result you want as opposed to funding basic research across many disciplines hoping for the serendipitous finding? Great, and we're going to hold that. Why don't you hand the microphone right over to this lady here, and we'll take this question, both of these together. Not that I want to give them a way out of the Viagra uh, issue. But. Uh, Sunitha Darby, Caltech. I was wondering, you've all sort of hinted at increasing funding for the NIH, but sort of changing the way they operate as a thing you would like to do. I was wondering, um, since they can't, as a government agency, have the risk rewards calculation that a private organization can have, what is sort of a realistic best case scenario for their, their role in, in science and development in medicine? And just to cap things off, I'm going to launch one, because after we close, Mary's going to come up and thank us all. And so this will consider your closing statement, et cetera. But, um, I am interviewing uh, Peggy Hamburg, the commissioner of the Food and, Food and Drug Administration, and uh, another woman CEO, Heather Bresch, who's the CEO of a f uh, firm called Mylon, which is one of the largest generic pharmaceuticals, and, and they've been worried about this global problem, bad drugs from China, others, et cetera, and, and getting it better. So I want to ask all of you, if, if you have any thoughts on questions I should pose to Peggy Hamburg, let me know a in addition to answering their questions. So, uh, Greg? Um, I, uh, maybe I would answer the gentleman's question first. I'm a huge believer in basic research. I used to work with Philip at the Sanford Burnham as the chairman there, and I just believe there is great benefit at some level of basic research that leads to this foundational understanding of how biology works. So I'm a huge proponent of that. I think uh, on top of that, though, as your question references, there could be some changes to other aspects of the NIH to make it more directed, more competitive, and more pushing translational research out. Um, which brings me then to your question of what would you ask uh, Peggy Hamburg. My question to Peggy Hamburg is, um, how do you rethink the equation of balancing speed and safety? You know, I would argue the person not in the room when you're approving a drug is the patient constituency. And you could almost, you know, notionally think about an equation where there's the drug company, there's the FDA, and then there is that patient advocate that says, you know, based on the data I see, we got your back. Let's get this one through because patients could benefit even though there are some risks and side effects. That whole equation is out the door right now, and we're not getting medicines to people right now soon enough that could have some benefit because we're not having the voice of the patient in the room. Interesting. Thank you. Santosh? I think serendipity plays a huge role in medicine and science, and uh, we've seen examples over the years, but I think there's a lot more that's um, not reported uh, than we, we think of, because we end up uh, finding something and then doing a project, publishing it, and it seems like it's a rational extension of a previous thought. And I certainly have seen it in my own clinic, and I think, like I said, I have a whole clinical trial based on one patient responding to Gleevec, uh, and we found a biomarker for that patient. And um, uh, so, uh, so I, I think the contribution of clinicians to advancing science is probably more uh, likely now than it was in the past. A lot of the academic medical centers, they're sort of intertwined, the clinical care, the clinical trials and research. And the more interactions that occur in that space, I think the better for fi finding things that are unexpected and then moving, uh, starting a new project that the Parkinson's Disease Foundation can fund, and et cetera. So I think there is a huge role for serendipity. And, and a lot of the, uh, the IT stuff that's happening of gathering data from every patient you can think of, 
formalizes that serendipity by finding little needles here and there that someone can follow up on somewhere else. Uh, so I, I, I think uh, that's very important. Uh, with the regards to the NIH, um, I think more funding is needed, and the structures there's, uh, of how to fund and what to fund is very important, and I don't have a solution for that, but uh, except brain cancer needs to be funded more. <laughs> <for sure. laughs> Debbie? So I don't think of serendipity, like I don't look at it as an, an or, I think it's an and. So we already make a pretty magnificent investment in basic science from which this serendipity comes. But if you were looking at corporations and you were just gonna bet your R&D budget on things coming out serendipitously, you wouldn't last very long. And I just think because it's public money, we kind of, and because biology is really hard, we just kind of chalk up our lack of productivity of capital to the fact that it's so hard. And I actually think we could be smarter about even finding this serendipity, which is a little bit of your observation too. <coughs> but I think we need to do add something on to, you know, thank goodness that we see the serendipitous findings, but I do think we can be more strategic. And I, I think it's mostly because we don't have too many entities. Um, you know, when we think of the NIH, I guess in one sense, I think it's a little of a misnomer. It's really the part the National Institutes of Discovery. But the fact that we call it the National Institutes of Health kind of implies it goes the gamut, and it really doesn't. And when we think of it, this, you know, Michael Fox would make a comment like, there's no department of cures. And so we invest in the inputs, but we don't really nurture and kind of chaperone what we're learning so that we kind of ultimately get that payoff. And so serendipity falls short, and, and it really is acutely felt when you're faced with uh, you know, a diagnosis and a disease where there is no treatment and you're, you're, you're suddenly do a deeper dive and you think, wow, I, you know, that's a lot of money. Can we get more for this? And I think we need to bring these things together. I, 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 I'm all in favor of more funding for the National Institute of Health. We, we our uh, folks on our team serve on NCATS. We're at, at, on council. We're, you know, we're, we're deep into that. It's just that, and on top of that, we need to be smarter about what's missing in our overall investment and at the margin, I think it's the translational um, and, the, and, the, and the role of patient in adding data and then even the role in, um, in helping us really understand unmet needs in this risk and reward. And I think one of the things you see in the philanthropy side is that some patients are f voting by saying, here's more capital to do things a little differently. Well, thank you, Debbie. Um, please give a round of applause to Debbie Brooks, Santosh Kasari, and Greg Lucier. And I think that... Um, I just, I just want to make a comment that, that in addition to our three great speakers, we should also pay respect to that little billion dollar chip in your pocket, Greg. Uh, thank you all very much.